In this lecture, we shall consider two of the greatest proponents of British neoclassicism, John Dryden and Alexander Pope. After a brief survey of the historical background of the period and a quick look at some similar historical trends in France, we shall analyze closely Dryden's Essay of Dramatic Poetry and Pope's Essay on Criticism. But first, a little historical background to get us set. The Apology for Poetry by Sidney was written in 1583 and then published in 1595. And at the same time that Sidney was writing his Apology, England was entering into her true golden age of literature. In less than a century, England would produce Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, John Donne, John Milton, and many, many others. This is probably the heyday of British literature. And interestingly, it all focuses around the time of Sidney's Apology for Poetry. Whether there was a cause effect is hard to prove, but again, Sidney's doing something that's maybe inspiring the arts. I like to think of it as similar to the phenomenon that occurred in America following Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous 1837 address, The American Scholar. Many of you have read that in school, The American Scholar. And it's interesting because after Emerson wrote that essay, which really kind of threw down the gauntlet and sort of challenged Americans to write their own literature, not just imitate Britain. And after he wrote that, America went into her golden age. Whitman and, and all these great poets and, and prose writers followed that. So it's kind of interesting. I like to think of the apology as the British version of The American Scholar, as something Thing that is a watershed, if you will. However, we've got this great, uh, you know, sort of forward thrust of art, but then art lags a bit in England. I'm back to England now. When the Puritan revolutionaries closed the theaters, and that was in 1642, the Puritan Revolution under Oliver Cromwell, they took over and they closed the theaters, and that caused a little bit of lag in art. But then. In 1660, we have the restoration of Charles II, the famous restoration, and the Puritan revolutionaries were out, and the monarchy was back in. And why is that important to us? Because after the, rev the restoration, there's a sort of anti-Puritanism. And what happens is, after the restoration, both poets and poetry turn with great force towards high society and the royal aristocratic manners of the court. There is, in fact, a concerted effort to return to Greek and Roman models. Think about it. The Puritans, what do they stand for? Democracy, equality, egalitarianism. Well, the British were so sick of all of that that they turned almost with a sort of pendulum swing back to aristocracy, back to that refinement that is neoclassicism. What happened to the revolutionaries? They went to America, right, and formed the American democracy. And again, neoclassicism seems very strange to Americans because we believe in democracy and egalitarianism and everybody's equal. That's not neoclassicism. Neoclassicism tends to be more elitist, more focused on the court and on royal manners. And so they're tired of the revolutionaries. Let's go back to the Greek and Roman models. Let's go back to Aristotle and Horace. Let's get back to fashionable art, high society art. And so beginning in 1660, and stretching on to the closing decades of the 18th century, England enters her neoclassical age. When we say neoclassicism, I mean, it pops up all over, but in Britain, the neoclassical age, it's funny because we call it the 18th century, but it starts in 1660. So 1660, almost to the end of the 18th century, is the neoclassical age. Now, that age has other names. It's also known as the age of reason or the age of enlightenment. And again, that was the idea where we wanted to go back to reason and rationality. It's also called sometimes the Restoration in 18th century. I want to give you these names because it goes by many different names. It's the same period we're talking about. Finally, the British themselves, they like to think of it as the British Augustan age because they were modeling themselves on the Augustan age of Rome. And in fact, Alexander Pope wanted to make himself another Horace, as we'll see when we get to Pope in a moment. So they thought that saw themselves as re-bringing back the Augustan age, the glory of Rome. The height of this age, this neoclassical age in Britain, is usually identified with the reign of Queen Anne from 1702 to 1714, but Samuel Johnson kept the neoclassical spirit alive all the way until his death in 1784. So neoclassicism is, is well over 100 years. It's very, very influential in England.
Now, I just want to mention quickly that about the same time as Britain had her neoclassical age, France was in the midst of her neoclassical age. Playwrights like Racine, critics like Boileau, and playwright critics like Corneille sought to model themselves precisely on classical precepts. You'll remember I said that Aristotle's ideas were revived by the French and they wrote plays that followed Aristotle to the letter. Well, this is that French neoclassical age. And the French neoclassicists had a great deal of influence on the British neoclassicists. In fact, all of British neoclassicism has a French air to it. Indeed, if you're a neoclassical scholar of Britain, you really need to know French because they, they adopt the sort of manner and courtly manner that we associate even today with the French, that kind of refinement that's very French. In the Romantic Age, Britain will become a little more German, but in the neoclassical, they're very French. All right, let's look at uh, John Dryden and his essay of dramatic poesy. John Dryden, in his essay, offers a succinct, if playful, overview of the main critical issues debated at the beginning of the neoclassical age. John Dryden actually lived and died in the 17th century. He's there at the beginning of the neoclassical age. Pope, that we'll get to in a moment, is a more central neoclassical figure. But John Dryden sort of kicks things off. And what's interesting, it's called the essay on dramatic poesy, but actually, like Plato's Republic, his, quote, essay is written in dialogue form. It's actually written in a dialogue, which makes it very interesting to read. And this dialogue, it's imaginary, takes place on the eve of a great battle in 1665 and concerns four men who, as they cross the Thames in a boat, discuss the issues of the day. It's a wonderful little setting. They're crossing the boat. There's bombs all over the place. They don't know what to do with themselves. So they say, well, let's talk. Let's have a great neoclassical conversation. And the neoclassicists were great conversationalists. You'd love to sit in on their dinners. Now, these four men do disagree on lots of particulars. That's why it's a dialogue. But interestingly, even though there are disagreements, they all accept three things. One, that art is a form of imitation. Two, that art should teach and please. And three, that it should follow either loosely or strictly the laws of decorum. In other words, they're all neoclassicists. They all agree with, with Aristotle and especially with Horace about imitation, teaching and pleasing, and decorum. So basically, with neoclassicists, you've got a certain core belief, and then people play with the particulars. The first issue of debate in the boat concerns their relationship with the ancients. And ancients means Greeks and Latin. Sometimes it means just the Greeks. But what should their relationship be? That's a very important issue for neoclassicists. The question they ask is, should they imitate them closely? Can you surpass them? What is our relationship? Well, one man who's very, very conservative neoclassicist, he says, we are but ill copiers of the ancients. Our merits are their merits, but our faults are our own. That's the real traditionalist that says, we can only just imitate them and try to touch them, but they're much greater than we are. But, because it's a dialogue, there is another man there who's a little bit more liberal, you might say, or progressive. He says that, no, we have progressed and improved art because now we have both nature and the ancients to imitate while they had only nature. So we're better because the, the ancients imitated nature. We can imitate nature and we can imitate the, the, the ancients at the same time. So in this sense, we're better off. We're a little bit more self-conscious than them. Believe it or not, today almost everybody would say Homer is greater than Virgil. But back in this time, people put Virgil above Homer. They put imitation above the originality of Homer. Very interesting, very neoclassical. Nevertheless, again I remind you, all of, the, uh, all of these critics, although they disagree on minor things, all agree that the ancients are to be honored and heeded. Neoclassicism is very traditional. You're supposed to respect the ancients. All right, the dialogue gets more specific as they consider the three unities. These three unities, the unities of time, place, and action, were derived from statements made by Aristotle and Horace, but actually what we call the full-fledged theory of the unities, the three unities, was actually codified by those French neoclassicists I mentioned a moment ago, Corneille, Racine, and Boileau. So these ideas come from Aristotle and Horace, but they weren't given their final shape until the French. Now, what are the three unities? All right, they have to do with the theater. The three unities of time, place, and action work this way. According to the unity of time, stage time must mimic real time as closely as possible. 
In any case, no more than 12 hours. In other words, a play takes about, excuse me, two hours to unfold. Well, the real action should be about that time. The best example, I bet you've all seen the movie High Noon. That is a movie that follows the unity of time because the movie starts at 10.30 and ends at high noon and it's about an hour and a half. And one of the reasons that movie is so tense is because every minute of movie time is a minute of real time. And that's the unity of time. That's true of Oedipus. Oedipus takes place in about half a day. It's very close to stage time. All right, what is the unity of place? According to the unity of place, action on the stage should be confined to a single space. It should not leap from city to city or locale to locale. Stick to one place. Oedipus, again, is my example. All of that play takes place in front of the palace of Oedipus. So stick to one place. Don't be jumping all over the place like you might do in a novel, let's say. One place. Finally, according to the unity of action, there should be one main plot that is not complicated or diluted by the interweaving of subplots. Don't write a play where there's lots and lots of things happening. You want one plot and you want it to be simple and unified. Those are the three unities. Now, once our four men define the unities, they start comparing and contrasting French theater with English theater. Basically, Racine with Shakespeare. Now, they decide that whereas most French plays follow the unities, best example would be Racine's famous play, The Phaedra, which is his version of Euripides' Hippolytus. The British, on the other hand, do not. French plays are very unified and decorous. They just follow Aristotle to the letter. English plays, British plays, are more lively. And think about it. Shakespeare breaks all three of the unities. Unity of time, his plays take place over long distances. You know, Hamlet takes place over several months. What about the unity of place? Shakespeare takes us all over the world, jumping from here to there to there to there. There's no unity of place. What about, finally, the unity of action? Think about King Lear. King Lear has the main plot, Lear and his three daughters, but it has a very prominent subplot of Gloucester and his two sons, Edmund and Edgar. Think about A Midsummer's Night's Dream. That has four plots all working at the same time. So Shakespeare does not follow the unities in any way. Notice Shakespeare, again, is our, exam is our, is our uh, he breaks the rules. He is the one who breaks decorum. Interesting. Now, Dryden, perhaps because he's an early neoclassicist, he finally decides, and by the way, one of the four men is supposed to be Dryden. It's not called Dryden, but it's clear he's embodying what Dryden believes. The Dryden persona, he concludes that British drama is finally better than the French drama, for although it respects the ancients, it is not afraid to part from them when necessary. So again, all neoclassicists are not so strict. They want you to follow the ancients, but you can add to them or change them. If there's a moral to D Dryden's essay, this is the moral. When the ancient rules of decorum are in sync with nature, they should be followed. But if they lead us to abuse nature, they must be altered or abandoned. The idea is you follow nature. And since usually the ancients follow nature, you follow them. But if they mess up, don't follow them. Don't, don't be like those formation flyers. The one goes in the pit and they all follow them there, in there. So again, uh, basically what I'm trying to say and what Dryden is trying to say is that neoclassical art is not just a pale copy of the ancients. It's not just a, a simple imitation. What it is is a traditional approach that requires laws and models but is not enslaved by them. Again, sometimes we have this idea that neoclassicists just imitates the ancients and that's it. No, they are very original, but they believe in laws and models and decorum. A good way to say this is that for the neoclassicists, decorum is not a straitjacket. Now, to us moderns who are post-romantics, it seems like a straitjacket. Most young poets say, I don't want to be stuck to the tradition. Don't tell me I've got to do this and I've got to do this. I want to do my own thing. Not for a neoclassicist. Decorum is important, but again, it's not a straitjacket. It doesn't force you. What it is is a guide and a touchstone that keeps you on track. So again, this is a higher view of neoclassicism, not the simplistic view that we sometimes have of just imitating blindly everything that happened before. All right, let us move on now to Pope's essay on criticism. Now, as I mentioned before, Alexander Pope is a central neoclassicist, so he's a little bit more strict than Dryden. We're going to see that his view of decorum is a little bit more strict than Dryden because he's living in the very heart of the neoclassical age. Now, Pope's essay on criticism 
is again not an essay. Guess what? It is a verse epistle. Just like Horace's art of poetry, it is a letter written in poetry. He's imitating Horace here. Now, his essay, Pope's essay, like almost all of his poetry, is written in what we call heroic couplets. What are heroic couplets? There are two lines of poetry. Each line of poetry has ten syllables and five stresses. In other words, da-dum, 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 da-dum. Two lines, and those two lines rhyme. Uh, uh, one of my favorite examples of a rhyming couplet, a heroic couplet, is the first line of Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel. It's about the days of King David, and he says, In pious times, ere priestcraft did begin, before polygamy was made a sin. <laughs> a little bit of that neoclassical wit I told you about. Now, why am I making such a big deal about these couplets? Although these heroic couplets are linked together in a series, there is always a strong stop at the end of each couplet. So, again, it's a poem. We want to read the whole thing. But at the end of each couplet is a strong stop, either a period or a semicolon or a colon, not even a comma usually, a very hard stop. And so when we read Pope's heroic couplets, it's not like reading a soliloquy from Shakespeare where we just sort of read through. We're forced to stop at the end of every um, a heroic couplet. And why is this important? Because this is very neoclassical. Rather than being free-flowing and meditative like the soliloquies, Pope's heroic couplets really read like a mathematical proof that moves logically step by step from proposition to proposition to conclusion. Students have a terrible time reading Pope because you know what they do? They don't understand the first po uh, heroic couplet, so they say, I'll skip it and move on. That doesn't work. You've got to understand every heroic couplet or you're lost, just like a mathematical proof. If you don't understand one step of the proof and you skip it, you're lost. And so, again, what I want to show you here is that Pope's heroic couplets express in themselves that sense of balance, order, and rationality that the neoclassicists prized so highly. Remember I said neoclassicists want to mix sound and sense? Well, the, the rationality of Pope living in the age of reason, the age of enlightenment, is mimicked by the sound of his heroic couplets. So again, he doesn't just arbitrarily write in heroic couplets. The sound of his poetry mimics the feeling or the sense he wants to convey. Now I warn you, if you read Pope, he cannot be read quickly. He calls for intense concentration and a keen sense of proportion. You know what it's like? It's like listening to Baroque music. If you listen to Bach or Handel, you've got to pay attention because everything is subtleties, isn't it? Very small subtleties, balance and rationality. I like to think of Pope's poetry as decorum set to meter. If you want to know what decorum is, just listen to the sound of Pope. Or again, listen to Baroque music by Bach uh, or, uh, again, Handel or some of the Baroque musicians. Again, that order and balance. All right, let's look specifically at the essay itself. Like Horace, Pope spends much time defining the proper role of the critic. According to Pope, true taste in a critic is as rare as true genius in a poet. In other words, criticism is not to be looked down upon. That's a gift, too. A true critic is as great as a true poet. Now, the function of the critic, therefore, is almost as vital as that of the poet. And we saw this before in Horace. The critic's important. Now, still, the poet is more important, finally, for neoclassicists. But the critic is important, and there is a relationship here. You know what? Pope tells us that in some ways a bad critic is more dangerous to art than a bad poet. Bad poetry, we can just dismiss it. But bad criticism can corrupt everything and form more bad poetry. So for Pope, criticism is very important. And he's very much a poet and critic at the same time. Now, many critics, according to Pope, write not out of the love of poetry or out of a fine sense of judgment, but out of envy and spite. They destroy what they cannot do. And if there's one thing that Pope hates, it's a bad critic. Bad critics are nasty people that can't write their own poetry, so they go around destroying other people. And that's a big no-no for Pope. For Pope, a true critic should be the handmaiden of poetry. A critic should respect poets and love them and help them. And yet, Pope knew that so often... 
critics turn against poets with Oedipal fury. We're back to that anxiety of influence. In other words, sometimes critics do what bad philosophers do. They attack poets. In other words, they attack what they cannot do. This is terrible. And, and uh, I mean, uh, Pope really lays it into these people. In fact, he compares bad critics to half-breed mules who lack both the genius of the poet and the taste of the true critic. Rather than accept the limits of their gifts, they elevate themselves by finding fault in others. And you've all experienced peevish, nasty critics. You know what a good example of this is? A lot of my college students, like most college students, have jobs where they work at a supermarket or they work at a you know, clothing store. And some of them have terrible managers. And I think you all know that usually the worst ones are the middle managers, not the top managers. Because oftentimes the middle managers have very low self-esteem, and so they give themselves jollies by stepping on you. So a lot of times, the ones that have more power are better because they don't need to prove anything. Well, that's what he's saying. Critics are like bad middle managers. Bad critics are like bad middle managers because they got to step on everything. Well, that's what a bad critic is. What is a good critic? The true critic, the good critic is like the true poet. He must learn humility. He must be humble. And according to Pope, and this is very neoclassical, the best way to learn humility is by exposing yourself to the sacred fire of ancient literature. You spend your time reading Homer and Virgil, that will humble you when you realize their greatness. And you'll get rid of all this nasty peevishness. Furthermore, the true critic for Pope must judge art not on the basis of his own prejudices, but via a close, fair, genial study of the poet's age, his chosen genre and mode of imitation, and the desired end and aim of his poem. Remember we talked about genial criticism before? A good critic is one who respects what the poet's trying to do. Doesn't impose his own taste upon the poet, but tries to figure out what the poet's trying to do, what kind of genre it is, what kind of mode of imitation, and follows along that way. That is genial criticism. So what Pope is telling us, basically, is that there's a right way to criticize and a wrong way to criticize. And what he's also telling us is that just like there's rules for poetry, there is rules for criticism, or there are rules for criticism. Now, alas, I would argue, modern academia has not heeded the advice of Pope. And I'll get on my soapbox a little bit here. I feel that many times modern theorists too often stand in judgment on the great poets of our tradition. What I'm saying is that rather than learn from the poet's genius, Many modern critics look down upon them as politically unenlightened. You know, sexist, racist, homophobic, right? Rather than judge poetry on its own merits, they bend poetry on the rack of modern theory. And one thing that bothered me, and I only graduated from graduate school in 91, so this is very fresh in my mind, one thing that bothers me about so much modern theory is so often, again, it stands in judgment. Rather, I mean, why do we go into poetry? Why do I go in, into, into teaching? I went in because I loved Shakespeare and Wordsworth and Milton, and I wanted to learn at their feet, to learn from them. But so often, in graduate school, students now are taught to look down on the poet as, again, woefully unenlightened. I'll give you an example of this. One of the things that bothers me is a lot of my students go to seminary, because I teach at a Christian school. And so often, students go to seminary with this great love of the Bible, the Word of God. And so often, when they leave seminary, they now look down on the Bible. I, it, it almost always happens after the first or second year of seminary, they start speaking condescendingly about St. Paul. Oh, well, you know, that's St. Paul's sexism. This is really something that bothers me because, again, we lose our respect. I mean, if we're not going to learn from people like St. Paul or people like Shakespeare, what are we in it for? And so, again, I really think that modern theory and modern seminaries can learn from Pope. We need to have a little humility and learn from these people. That's why they're still read. And we'll probably be forgotten. <laughs> okay, finally, according to uh, Pope and his neoclassical theory, the best poets and critics look to nature as the source, the end, and the test of art. I've alluded to this many times, but let me say it now. For neoclassicists, you look to nature. Nature is the ultimate source of poetry and the ultimate end or goal and the test. Now, by nature, I don't just mean trees. I mean nature, reality. They want to find the way the world is and imitate that. 
Now, according to Pope, we follow the ancients because in following them, we follow nature. And so, Pope says in a famous phrase, Virgil discovered that to imitate Homer was to imitate nature. The reason Virgil imitated Homer was because Homer got it right, so Virgil might as well imitate. You know, we want to learn from the people that got it right. That's a very neoclassical, traditional way of looking at things. But Pope goes beyond that. He says, you know what? Even the ancients did not really invent the rules of decorum. They didn't invent decorum. They found it there in nature. According to a neoclassicist, nature is organized in terms of decorum. And what we do is we try to discover that decorum and imitate it. Let me give you an example of Pope's heroic couplets. He says, those rules of old discovered, not devised, are nature still, but nature methodized. So we take what's in nature and we use it. According to Pope, nature is the best touchstone of art, for it is unchanging and eternal. How can we measure art? Let's measure art against something that doesn't change, nature. Rather than against changing fashions and whatnot, let us test art against something that is unchanging. Now, I want to make a little analogy here to another work by Pope. In addition to his essay on criticism, Pope wrote an essay on man, which was more about philosophy. And in his essay on man, Pope sums up the neoclassical vision of the cosmos by asserting that in nature, all is ordered and everything has its proper place in the great chain of being. Many of you may have learned before this idea of the great chain of being. You see, neoclassicists not only look for decorum in poetry, they look for decorum in the universe itself. And according to the great chain of being, there's a hierarchy. At the top of the chain is God, then the higher order of angels, down to the lower order, down to man and the animals, and all the way on down to the rocks. Everything has a place. It has a rung, let's call it, in the ladder that is the great chain of being. That is a very ordered view of the world, neoclassical. And according to Pope, we must accept our place in this chain and the limits that come with it. In other words, uh, if we want to be human, we've got to stay on our own. Don't try to become an angel, go up, or try to become a beast by going down. You've got to stay where you belong in the great chain of being. Now, notice in the same way that we've got to accept our limits sort of philosophically, we must also accept the laws and restraints of decorum. So you see how, again, one of the things about neoclassicism is it has this wonderfully rational, ordered view of the universe. And that's what we call the Enlightenment, right? What we call the age of reason. Now, although Pope admits that there are times when, in a moment of Longinian sublimity, a poet may fly beyond the rules of art to a higher plane, such flights of fancy should be the exception and not the rule. In other words, like Dryden, he admits, yes, there are some times when you want to break away and break from decorum for effect. But that should be the exception, not the rule. That's very neoclassical. In romantic art, they're always breaking away. For neoclassicists, they break away when necessary, but in general, you want to stay. Because if that becomes not the exception, but the rule, you've lost decorum. So again, this is a very neoclassical view. According to Pope, we must never let our genius or our wit overrun our judgment or our art. In fact, Pope tells us that it is the restraints that make us poets that make us finally human beings. What makes us a poet is because we follow decor. It's not originality and novelty that makes us a poet, as is so often the case today. What makes us a poet is the restraints themselves. And in the same way, what makes me a human being is because I am neither an angel, up the rung, or a beast, down a rung. You see the difference there? So there is a link between, again, the view of the cosmos and the view of poetry. Restraint is important because it makes us human and it makes us a poet. Again, I'd encourage you to listen to some Baroque music. You will hear that restraint. And you might want to contrast that with something like Wagner, a romantic uh, composer where they're always trying to break out of the form. All right. In our next lecture, we will move on to our third unit on the philosophical roots of romanticism.